Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, David Paul. I am going to be here to talk to you about a new kind of money. And uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I will be you know, starting my presentation with, um, with a view, a slide showing you the, the beauty of the Marshall Islands. Um, the photo here is basically uh, from a vase value, you're seeing all these kids, and they're just being kids. They're enjoying the, their, their day out, out in the water, enjoying the beach, you know, swimming. But uh, there's a saying, you know, the word, a picture is a word of a thousand words. And this is really what it's really all about. It is the future of the Marshall Islands, the future of these kids, and the reason why we're doing this uh, new kind of money, the, uh, the digital currency we call the SOF. We as a government, uh, we, we face a lot of uh, challenges uh, in order to try to provide uh, the, what is best for the future of the marshals. And among the challenges we have is actually being able to access to the, uh, the global financial system. Right after the, the attacks on the, the World Trade Center back in uh, 2001, uh, September 11, which is really today's the anniversary, of those uh, uh, horrific attacks. Uh, the Marshall Islands was actually been marginalized to a point where we were not able to you know, gain access to a lot of these uh, financial services because of given the size of the market, the financial markets were very, very small. So we're not able to secure any, any uh, correspondence banking um, uh, uh, relationship with, with uh, foreign banks because of the risk posed given the size of the market and then the, the, the cost that it may cost, you know, whoever we're working with. So uh, all of that changed when, when the, uh, the blockchain technology came into the picture. And that's the reason why we've embarked on this, this uh, particular uh, journey. Uh, the Marshall Islands gained independence back in 1979 as, uh, as an independent country from the former trustee of the Pacific Islands. And we are among only three countries in the world that is actually uh, has a close relationship with the United States. Uh, our, our national currency is actually the U.S. dollars. We use the U.S. dollars as our, our, our currency. And with the SOF, is going to be introduced alongside the U.S. dollar uh, in parallel. So there is really no correlation as far as the value is concerned. They're both independent of one another. Uh, the four basic fundamental uh, values of our, our, uh, our RMI soft, which is the, probably the most transparent, the most reliable, uh, and most dynamic uh, digital currency in the world. Uh, one is uh, sustainable, two is safe, uh, three, the SAV is fair, and the fourth is actually simple. Uh, the reason I'm saying uh, it is sustainable is because, you know, basically we do not, you know, that have the capacity or the capability to actually print money as we please as a government. Because we all know what's happening in the world is, you, you, you know, wake up one morning and you have the key the to the machine to print more money to flood the market and increase the supply of money which actually devalues the overall value of your currency, you know, in the process. Now, having, you know, resorted to that, we decided to, you know, launch our, launch our own, our own uh, national currency uh, as, uh, as a legal tender by doing, going through with the uh, digital uh, format and um, in a digital format. So, so it's, the supply is actually fixed at 4%, so that's why it's sustainable. Two, uh, it is safe and automated compliance. Uh, the difference, and we'd like to uh, make it clear to everyone that, you know, instead of the balance between, you know, being secrecy and being having a privacy. So basically what we've done is we want to make sure that, you know, if you are a, a soft holder who owns softs, you will continue to have maintain your privacy. Not so much secrecy, but more privacy. So you'll be able to enjoy that uh, privacy of having your uh, soft in place. So we have a very regress and robust uh, KYC process for you to be enter and be part and to take part in the uh, the in owning soft, 
Uh, third is actually fair because it's, it's basically uh, when, we, when there is an uh, increase in number of SAF, uh, 4% annually, it will be distributed to among all the SAF holders. So everybody gets a fair share. So whatever the, the percentage of your holding of SAF, you'll get whatever the percentage of that 4% annual growth or annual increment of uh, number of SAF annually. And the uh, last one is actually is, is very easy to use and manage and regulate and, and is actually auditable. Uh, now, the, the SAF, the proceeds from the SAF is, uh, is basically uh, will be distributed among these different funds that we created. The certain percentage of the proceeds from the SAF will go to the RMI Marshall Islands Green Climate Fund. The second one will go to the uh, Nuclear Legacy and Healthcare Fund. And the other, one, the other one is actually our National Trust Fund. And 10% of it actually will be distributed among all the resident citizens in the Marshall Islands so they can be widely circulated in the, in the country. And the other one it, uh, is 30% of it, it will be allocated to the Soft Development Foundation, which will keep and manage the, uh, the ecosystem of the SAF, around the SAF. And it is actually uh, a nonprofit uh, foundation that will pretty much uh, regulate the, uh, the, the, the ecosystem of around the SAF. The next slide, is, it talks about uh, the time release monetary issue, and so called the TRMI. Uh, what is really TRMI? TRMI is a sales of pre-SAF units exchanged for the SAF legal tender once it's issued. So why are we doing it? It's because, first and foremost, as a country, you know, we really have a one shot at this. You know, this is really not a typical IPO where if it fails, then you're always going to go back to the drawing board and then go back and do it again. This is really about the reputation and the integrity of a nation here. And that's why we got to do it in a way that is most very responsible and transparent and will be acceptable by everyone. The reason why we're doing it in gradually and in phases, so we want to make sure that we are all comfortable in what we do. And how, do we, how does the time release of monetary issuance work? It will actually be done in an 18-month period of auctioning of the, of the, uh, the uh, pre-sales of the SAF. Uh, the, the SAF timeline uh, basically gives you an uh, understanding of what we've done. If we've come, so far, back in uh, the first half of the 2018, the parliament, our national parliament, passed an enabling legislation for us to establish the SAF. And the second part of it, actually, we de start designing the compliance architecture around the SAF. And earlier part of this year, we started and continued to engage with the uh, US Treasury and the IMF uh, and continue their feedbacks. Because the, what is really important for the SAF for us is really the regulatory regime uh, of the SAF. So it should be able to be acceptable, especially among the regulators. Uh, now, we're looking at uh, the, the second, second part of 2019 as the, the pre-registration. And then uh, we will be inviting you to you know, visit the website, the SAF website, to, to pre-register so you can get more information about the the, uh, the issuance of the SAV and all the, all the good stuff, the news about you know, when the SAV is going to be uh, launched. Uh, so we're looking at maybe you know, 2020, 2021, that's when we're looking at the, when the SAV is going to be officially launched. So we're not going to really commit to a certain time, time frame because of the, because of the uh, with respect to the regula regulatory aspect of it. Now, uh, thank you. I, I think we're run, running out of time, but uh, just wanted to say thank you for your, your attention and uh, would like to you know, invite you to visit our, our, our uh, website, the sov.foundation, and that's where you're going to be able to uh, pre-register. 
So if you're interested in more information about the, the issuance of the SAP, then uh, you'll just put in your information and you should be able to get regular updates on, on, on where, the, where we're going with the, the development of the SAP. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I will be very happy to answer any questions uh, going forward. Thank you so much. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Minister. If you'd, have, if you'd like to have a seat, we would now like to welcome to the stage the Director of Strategy for Coindesk, Nolan Barrelly. Uncle. All right, here he goes. So um, in my capacity as a Director of Strategy, it would have been a lot of fun working with you guys because it looks like you did a, a, a pretty blue sky thing here and, and really sort of pushed uh, uh, something we would like to see more of in the future. Um, but it sounds like, from what I understand, the journey that you took was not without the expenditure of political capital. It looks like there was quite a road for you to even get to this point, um, a vote of non-confidence. So you guys really do believe in this, to have gone through all of those hoops. And if you could describe a bit of that journey for us that I think really underlines your conviction in, in what you're doing. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, thank you so much. And like any other uh, new uh, phenomenon, so to speak, people will always have the tendency of having, you know, being skeptical and this, being cynical and, uh, you know, have a lot of skepticism on, on how the process will work and how the product is going to pan out. And there's no difference than, uh, than the, the SAB when we first introduced the idea and even went further into uh, enacting a legislation. Now, a lot of folks were saying that we actually uh, were putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. But you know, in a, it's a small island country with very limited resources, we thought that it was very important for us to come out front and show the political commitment by the RMI government to enact the legislation so we can you know, tell who our partners that we are interested, we are very serious about you know, pursuing this. So we are actually putting out a lot of political capital up front in order to convince those who are willing to take the risk with us in order to move forward. And it sounds like those partners are also an impressive part of this process. Uh, you guys, you know, small island, 53,000 folks, probably not a ton of developers uh, contributing to Bitcoin Core and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so what did you guys do to go about and get this sort of technical expertise and, and import it into your country? Well, you know, if you, because the, the World Wide Web or the Internet is actually that was connects everybody, right? So like any other uh, uh, developed and big uh, cities of the world, the Marshall Islands is actually connected to the world through, the, through the, uh, the, the fiber optic cable. So we have that access to, to technology like Google and all that stuff. Now, I, I would like to you know, make an illustration. When we, first, when we first gained independent back in the 1970s, we never really had any electricity in the country. So when, when our first uh, president and the cabinet at the time went out and you know, get you know, generators and electric poles and transmission lines to put up, there was nobody in the country can actually fix engines and install poles and you know, being an, there was no electrician and there was no mechanical engineers and all that. A Couple of decades later, we have a lot, if 99% of the Mar people that are working in our power plant are Marshallese. Now, it's the same thing that we're trying to do. We may, may not have the capacity right now, but we have the resource that can actually build that capacity with the people. So with this you know, importing into the country like any other places, we can build that capacity and train Marshallese to be you know, you know, software engineers and so forth and so forth. So we've made that transition into the industrial world uh, and the industrial era. We can make that transition into the digital uh, digital era. And would you say that the use case that really got you guys thinking about this was, of course, the ability for these folks to now have correspondent banking services, let's say, to be able to put their money around the world and, and not having to pay the, the large remittance fees that they were really being uh, abused with? Um, and is that really what you think is going to help drive and incentivize the use, not just the fact that you're going to be giving 10% of supply to the people, but that there is a clear use case immediately when this thing comes online that they can use it right off the bat. 
Yeah. Well, our, we have a, a significant portion of our population lives outside the country. And, you know, our, our, our population, Marshall, Marshallese population living in the country, uh, continues to depend on all these remittances that are being remitted from, the, from overseas. And these folks actually pay up to 10% of their cost in remitting uh, those remittances into the country. So 10% is, is a lot of money. And with the SOF and with the blockchain technology in place, that should eliminate that, uh, that cost altogether. So go, going to the technology again, um, there's a lot of other countries, not a lot, a few notorious countries that have tried this. To what extent did you learn from the failures, for example, of Petro? No one wants it, no one's interested, no one wants to go near it. What did you guys do when you saw this? How did that, how did that a different approach that you guys took get formed from seeing these types of projects? Well, I, I think it's, it's very important to make a contrast between the SAV and the Petro, because I think the uh, SAV is really a legal tender of the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. We reserve that right as a nation to issue our own currency. And instead of issuing it in a fiat format, we decided that it's better to use it and issue it in a, in a digital format. Mm -hmm. So that is one. And it is a, it's a legal tender of a nation compared to like any other private uh, digital money that are being issued. Mm -hmm. so, so it is really as the full faith and credit of the country, you know, first, first and foremost. And, um, and, and, and that's why uh, we believe that this is, this is something that is special for us. And second, you know, we really have a one shot at this. This is not a regular IPO, as I said. It is really about the, the reputation and the integrity of a nation. And we want to do it right, and we want to do it right the first time. And, and that's why we are taking it slowly, methodically, making sure that we meet all the regulatory compliance in the process. Because, as I said, it, it, there's no room for error, so to speak. We got to do it right, and we got to do it right the first time. So it's really, failure is really not an option. That's why we are taking it slowly, methodically, gradually, to make sure that we, we, cr we you know, cross all the T's and tie all the I's. So it looks like the monetary policy that you guys have settled on is something really sophisticated and really speaks to the heart of a lot of people who love Bitcoin because it is a sort of reliable sovereign. Um, you're dealing with the Milton Friedman 4% um, uh, issuance per year and growth of the supply. How did you guys come to that? Was it really to say that you see this, this lever being pulled by other governments sort of willy-nilly and you're going to say, no, we're going to do something predictable we're not going to abuse this power as we issue a currency. How did you guys settle it? Well, we wanted to be transparent. We wanted to be portrayed as a responsible government, a responsible player in the process. We, we, we thought that, uh, and also we know that the market does not like surprises. We, we wanted to come up front, be clean, and say, listen, um, here's the rule, and here's the rule that we're willing to play by. And we will put it out there and say, you know, there's not going to be any surprises where I wake up one morning and I'm just going to go open the machine that prints the money or coin the money or the mint of coins and say, okay, you know, because I feel that I need another, I have a project that I need to do as a government, then I'm going to flood the market and devalue your holdings. You have to be honest and you have to be transparent about it up front so you can gain confidence because you really are at the mercy of the market at the end of the day because you may get a, you may print it and get a short-term gain, but it's going to be a long-term pain because the market is going to retaliate through market corrections. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that. So, so let, let's go a little further with that. Is this coin going to be active in secondary trading after you get you know, signed up? Will this coin be available on exchanges if they, if they decide to list it? Is that something that you anticipate, a lot of speculation around it? Um, well. I, I, we're still developing it, but at the same time, what I can tell you right now is we, we, it's going to have, you're going to have to go through a very rigorous KYC process. And we're also going to be engaging uh, 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 exchanges that are in a very well-regulated market. So, so that way, you're comfortable, I'm comfortable, and those who are part of that process and part of the SOF will be comfortable that anybody that comes in they've actually gone through a very rigorous process of being screened. Mm -hmm. So we know that we're all pretty much 
uh, good to go, and we're all legitimate players. So in, in the actual sale itself, uh, you mentioned these options on the auction. How is that going to work? What is that going to look like? Can anyone buy it? Will, will, will I be able to buy it in New York City? Um, yeah, I mean, it, when we do the, uh, when we do the uh, pre-soft pre sale, it was go, it's going to go through the uh, TRMI process, mm -hmm. which will allow us to first and foremost to establish liquidity. Because that was, that's the purpose of the TRMI. And then once the TRMI is done and we, we're, we're able to know and establish liquidity in the market, and then, then we will go to the actually actual issuance of the SAF. And then there's only going to be so much SAF available, and it's going to be available through, you know, through the process of going through the KYC process or going through certain exchanges. But the process is going to be very transparent, and you're going to go through a certain uh, uh, mechanism where it's going to be pointed. So if you look at the, uh, the website that we've actually designed, it's going to give you all the information that you will need it. Because right now, we're still developing it. As it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So it's not a stable coin. This is going to be a free floating coin that has price discovery around it, will have global access, and anyone can bet on it or bet against it. Absolutely. That's the goal. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and in, in that case, how do you imagine some of these uh, foreign buyers will be interested in the coin? Is it the actual use cases that, that there's this, so much traffic from remittances going through uh, uh, all these different uh, networks that you imagine people will say, okay, I, I can see the volumes here. There's going to be a, a use for this just because of the, uh, of the, the, the capital flow. Well, the, the value way I see it, the value of the SAW will be based on the, the frequent usage of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for you to participate, I mean, it's, it's not an exclusive uh, coin. It's open for everybody. Mm -hmm. But for you to get in, you have to go through a rigorous process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, that's, that's, and whatever the price of the SAW at that time and willing to pay for it, mm -hmm. then and you're willing to do it, then you will have it. You'll, you'll, you'll have your share of, of SAF when So you is, do it. is the idea, let's say, like the Cayman Islands, whose uh, uses far outweigh the population and their local expenditures of, of that coin. It's, it's a much more useful liquid coin around the world and is one of the major currencies in the world despite the size of that island. Mm. Um, now, of course, that's all built on the massive flows that come in because of the, the, the hedge funds and, and all the sophisticated uh, financial buy side folks that are there. Um, does this seem to you uh, uh, the ability to sort of grow the size of, of the uh, usefulness of this coin, irrespective of the small population that's in market? Absolutely, market? absolutely. Yeah. But in this case, maybe a little bit different because the Cayman Islands, in my view, you know, it definitely serves the private interests of the hedge funds and it's a, it's a stable coin for all intents and purposes. It's pegged to the US dollar and trades at a 20% premium and that's just the way it is. Um, but nevertheless, that's got a lot of people involved. But from what I'm hearing from your coin, it sounds like the main goal was always to keep, uh, to give the people of the country a tool. It doesn't matter that it's a blockchain technology or anything like that. Here's a way for the average folks to use it, which I don't think was really what they had in mind in Cayman Islands. It ended up working for the people mm -hmm. very, very well. But is that something that is in, in your mind, that this one tool used by people will help change everything for the country? It's a very transformative uh, process and all, to, all together because it's really, it's nothing has been like, the, you know, I don't think the world has ever seen something like this. From a small island country like ours, uh, I think with the, uh, with the internet and then the, uh, the World Wide Web, basically it's really the equalizer for small island economies like the Marshalls mm -hmm. to take advantage of that. And, and uh, the, the SAV will be, uh, will be in circulation in parallel with the U.S. dollars. So there's no correlation, none whatsoever. The U.S. dollar you know, has its own value, and the SAV will have its own value. And there's no, no, no linkages whatsoever. No stable coin? No. Um, so what I wonder is, you know, if, if this does happen, and you end up having you know, so much volume coming into the country, um, will you do any side policy initiatives to invite a lot of the other crypto infrastructure players around the world? Are there other side initiatives that you can see growing very easily alongside this coin? So you see a lot of jurisdictional arbitrage right now, exchanges going to Malta and Bermuda. 
Is that something on your roadmap to sort of couple with this natively digital sovereign coin? Well, that's why we have established the foundation, mm -hmm. the non, uh, not for profit foundation that actually will help manage and to uh, nurture the, uh, the ecosystem around the, mm -hmm. the SOF. So and you can imagine a, a suite of financial services springing up in the atolls all around the Marshall Islands because of that. Absolutely. So it would be a kind of Cayman Islands 2.0 without the need to domicile these folks and start banks that only serve people offshore, you know, away from the island. This is a way to have the locals benefit uh, and also to induce uh, and, and incentivize and attract all kinds of new sophisticated financial services. Well, and, and our goal is to be uh, a very transparent and uh, upfront, you know, above board uh, a currency like, like the SAF. And, and with, with that in place and with the, with the uh, establishment of the uh, foundation, will allow, allow the Marshall Islands to be a very, you know, a haven for, for, so instead of creating a haven for folks to flee other jurisdiction because of all the secrecy and all that stuff, no. We wanted to provide you the, uh, the privacy you need, but also will be in full compliance with all the reg regulations and the, the global regulatory regimes that are out there. So, so it provides stability because it's really, there's no surprises. We know that whatever laws and whatever uh, rules that they're being played, uh, played by are, are acceptable, are in compliance with, with international regimes. Mm -hmm. so, so we wanted to make sure that our, uh, the RMI, the SOF, is exactly that. So, but this is still an ongoing process, and I believe you have an advisor from, formerly from the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks. How did that relationship come about, and what is that really targeted towards? Well, it's also instilled confident that, you know, you know given the limitation of, uh, of the capacity we have in the country, we've, we've enlisted the, uh, the services of the best and the brightest in the industry. To, to instill confidence in the in in the industry and the in the the global, confidence side of the full faith and confidence absolutely in the process and how these things has been done built and implemented mm -hmm. so it is not just like a like a, a side project you know it is really about the integrity and the future uh, financial stability of a nation the, so the name is befitting sovereign really is about the sovereign independence of the country to issue this piece of property mm -hmm. and and make it uh, really the, the the thing that you think can help bring the people forward um, so you know I want to I want to conclude I think on um, you know, the IMF doesn't look to be so keen on all of this and your one correspondent banking relationship that you have the one you know, thread you have connecting the country to the entire global financial system um, could be jeopardized by this. It, it could be. How do you guys, uh, you know, how, how does that help you? Uh, how do you sleep when you have that specter above you? Well, yes, it could be. And, and that's why we're very mindful of, of the, the ramification and the consequences of not uh, working with the, with the regulators. That's why we are doing it in a very gradual, transparent, and methodical manner, in uh, working with the the IMF, the the the, um, the U.S. Treasury, because these are the these are the entities that will be able to, you know, make or break, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and given the the special relationship we have with the United States, we think that is very very important for us to continue to be in the lockstep mm -hmm. with the uh, U.S. Treasury. That's why we have a very uh, a very robust exchange and uh, exchange of views with the uh, Department of uh, Treasury on, on the progress and uh, what we've done. We've been having exchanges back and forth, and uh, we've been exchanging views and notes and, you know, you know where we are on, the, on the, uh, the development and the architect of the uh, SOF itself. Now, having said that, we are also mindful that we need to make sure that our correspondent banking relationship does not jeopardize because once that's done, then uh, we will be completely cut off from the from the rest of the world Lights financially. Oh. Yeah, but but we're confident. I think as long as we can uh, honestly and uh, transparently work with all the issues, because nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these are all man-made, mm -hmm. and we are the one who are making things complicated. Mm -hmm. You know. 
Well, they've that, deputized that inf entire sector to be to do the work of police. Yeah, you know that that, that happened. But as long as we can, because the, we can only minimize the risk that are known to us. We cannot minimize risks that are unknown. But at the same time, the SOF is designed to be flexible and agile in order to deal with any arising risk that we may not know now, that may arise, they may come up tomorrow. And the, the architect of the, the architecture of the uh, SOV is agile enough to be able to adjust to these risks. And that is really the, 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 the most important component of the SOF is to be flexible enough to be able to adjust to it as early as possible in order to minimize uh, the risk, or otherwise, then what's the point of, of developing it and issuing it? Well, I'd say that a lot of people in the crypto industry think that just the, the sheer contact you're having with US Treasury and the type of education that you're providing is a benefit to everyone in this industry. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certain a lot of people in the crypto industry are really happy that this is happening and that you guys are, are you know, moving forward with the Treasury and, and getting them to see the benefits of this technology. Let me tell you just one point. When we first met them, our first encounter, we walk into the room and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury told me point blank, we don't like this and we don't want this and we will not support this, right? Mm -hmm. So after the exchange went back and forth and several meetings and they were like, wow, mm -hmm. we can work with you. Mm -hmm. I think we can make this work. Mm -hmm. We can actually bring this into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, coming from the U.S. Department of Treasury, right? It's a win. Yeah, because it's, it's always the perception that digital currency or cryptocurrency is criminal, is, you know, all these bad stuff that you hear about. It doesn't mean that because criminal uses it, meaning that we have to demonize it. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, you know, guns mm -hmm. or airplanes when they ran into the World Trade we, we shouldn't be criminalizing airplane and no, guns. No, no. It's really the people behind it. We need to put in the compliance in place in order to minimize all these risks, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, sir, you'll be able to dine out on that story with the, Treasury, with the Secretary of the Treasury uh, for the rest of your life if we're all right <laughs> about crypto. All right. Thanks Thank you so much. Time. All right.